Okay, so in this video, I'm gonna share with you seven things that worship leaders in today's churches just need to stop doing. Like, stop doing it right now, please. That's coming up today on The Beat. Hey, my friend, welcome back to The Beat. My name is Alan Parr. Thank you so much for tuning in. If this is your first time here, it's a pleasure. If you want a free ebook, click the link in the description box below. If you enjoy this video, consider subscribing. Hit that little bell notification so you won't miss a beat. Okay, so let me start off by saying I love church and I absolutely love worshiping in church and outside of church. As a matter of fact, many of you may not realize this, but I was a worship leader, served on a variety of church staffs for about 15 years in my life. And so by uh, no means am I an expert on worship. There are some things that I've learned both from personal experience as well as just observing. And here are seven things that I've seen that worship leaders just need to stop doing doing right now. Number one, stop making worship all about you. And what I mean here is this. Oftentimes, whenever you go to certain churches, the worship leader will just be doing all these riffs and runs and all these high notes and all these different things vocally that the congregation can't follow. They can't really mimic what you're doing because they can't sing that well. And so it comes off after some time that the worship experience is really more about you showcasing your gifts and your talents and how well you can sing more than it is about you actually leading the people somewhere so that they can get closer to God in this experience in church. That's why I've always said that, in my opinion, some of the greatest worship leaders are the ones that have the most average voices because they're not up there trying to impress anyone with how they sound, they understand that it is their job not to impress people, but to lead the people into God's presence so they can have a connection with God. So if there's anything about your presentation or your personality that is too flashy, that is possibly distracting people from getting into the presence of God, or it's about you and you know in your heart that it is, then my friend, just leave that at the door because that's not what worship is all about. Number two, stop singing songs that are theologically inaccurate. And once again, what I mean here is this, you as a worship leader, my friend, you have a phenomenal opportunity at your fingertips to lead people into God's presence and to teach them something about the nature and the character of God in the same way that a pastor can communicate and teach people about God you are able to do that through the songs that you present to your congregation because in many situations, your congregation is going to leave that church experience and they're going to sing these songs over and over again throughout the week. And whatever the lyrics are in those songs is going to get into their mentality and they're going to start to believe those things. And so there is a lot of songs out here now that they sound good. They make us feel good. But my friends, some of them are just not theologically accurate. A few of them that I can think of that are really popular now is a song called So Will I. And there's a verse in there that goes, And as you speak, a hundred billion creatures catch your breath, evolving in pursuit of what you said. If creation sings your praises, so will I. And you sing that song and you're so moved by the music and the lyrics and you're like, oh man, this is one of the most beautiful worship songs that has ever been written. But then you go back and read the lyrics and you're like, wait a second. But as you speak, creation catches your breath, evolving in pursuit of what you said. Wait, that sounds like evolution. That's not how God created things. When God spoke, Things were created. They didn't have to evolve into being something. And so that's theologically inaccurate. Beautiful song. So if you want to still sing that song of the church, you need to switch up the lyrics so it doesn't communicate evolution. Here's another one. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. Now, that's one of those popular songs, right? But is that the reason why Jesus came to earth was because he was lonely in heaven? He didn't want heaven without us. And so he brought heaven down. You see what I'm saying? There should be someone at your church that has a theological uh, uh, degree or someone that uh, has been to seminary or whatnot that can look at the lyrics of all of these songs and assess whether they really do accurately reflect the character of God. Because 
just as a preacher will, you're going to have to stand before God one day and give an account for how you stewarded the opportunity to lead people into worship. Now, while we're talking about song selection, we should also keep at a minimum those songs that really don't provide a lot of depth in terms of uh, who God is and his nature. I call them the 7-Eleven songs. You sing the same seven words 11 times in a row. You just keep repeating it again and again and again. We need to evolve, so to speak, past that. And then finally, if we're going to talk about song selection, try to sing songs that most of the congregation knows, not just songs that the worship leader or the worship team knows, because just because it may be your favorite song, it may not necessarily be a song that everyone else knows. And so try to make sure that it's, that it's a group of songs that the congregation can actually engage in. So they're not focusing so much on reading the words and learning a new song that they can't really reflect on the worship. Number three, stop being predictable. And what I mean here is this, there is this idea that worship should always consist of starting off with two very fast, upbeat songs, and then you have kind of a, a quiet time, the lights go down, and then you sing a slow worship song, and then you're done. That's predictable. That's the same thing every single week. Our God is not predictable, so therefore our worship should not be. So switch it up a little bit. Be creative. Maybe you want to sing a hymn. Maybe you want to start off without any instruments and do a cappella. Or maybe you want to start off with a reading of scripture. Or maybe a duet. Or maybe a solo. Or maybe some sort of instrumental or something of that nature. So that way it's not just the same thing all the time, but you're varying up the type of worship experience that people have. Number four is a pet peeve for me. Stop commanding people to worship. I don't know about you, but have you ever been in a worship service where the worship leader will say, okay, if you love Jesus, stand to your feet right now and give God a shout of praise. And everybody stands up and they're like, I love you, Jesus. And what happens? Most of those experiences or, or, or should I say most of those people, they're not genuine. They just don't want to be pointed out. They don't want to be seen as the person that doesn't love Jesus. And so they feel coerced into doing something that they don't naturally feel like they really want to do. And the people that rebel against it and sit down are looked at as, man, you must not love Jesus or you must not want to be here or whatever. As worship leaders, our job is not to command people to worship. Our job is to lead them into the presence of God, understanding that people are coming in from a variety of places. Some of them may have had a fight with their spouse. Some of them may have lost a loved one. Some of them may have just lost their job. And quite frankly, they don't feel like standing up and giving God a shout of praise. So the better thing to do would be simply to invite them and say, you know what? Um, if, if you feel so led, I want to invite you to stand with us today. And as we, as we come together and uh, express our worship towards God. But if you don't feel that way, I encourage you to just sit right where you are in the quietness of your own heart and just connect with God in your own way. And that way it puts everybody at ease. Nobody feels like they're forced to have to do something and people can kind of get there at their own pace instead of being commanded to doing so. Number five is an absolute huge one and that is this. Don't just sing the songs, lead the people into worship. Your job, my friend, as a worship leader is not just to sing up there with the guitar and just sing. Your job is to help the people connect the lyrics of the song to where they are at in their personal life, to teach them something about God, which is why you're called a worship leader. And so the way you do this is, let's just say, let's, we'll take a song. It'll be like, your love never fails and never gives up. It never runs out on me, right? So you're singing that. That is a tender moment where you want to just stop the song and say, you know what? There may be some of you out here where you feel like you've done something that do you that you've escaped God's love or you don't feel like God loves you anymore. And you help the people understand what this song means and what God wants them to get out of it so that they're not just singing songs and just doing going through the motions, but they realize, wow, that's what that song means. God's love will never fail me. It'll never run out on me. And then you follow that up with the moment where you ask them to just sit before God and confess their sins and get their hearts ready and right before God. Instead of just going through and singing the song, lead them somewhere while you're leading them in worship. So once again, understand that the majority of songs and lyrics that your congregation is singing every single week 
Many of them may not have a clue about what those lyrics mean. And so your job is to help them understand the depth and the richness of what those lyrics mean and how it applies to their life. Number six, stop quenching the spirit. Now, what I mean here is this. Sometimes there is a beautiful, tender moment in worship. And if we're not careful, we may miss it because we're trying to force this next song on the song list. And many churches nowadays, they're getting away from this because everything is scripted. Even the worship is just scripted. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to sing this three times. We're going to sing that two times. We're going to come back into the chorus or whatever. And there's no room at all for the Holy Spirit to move. We have to have worship leaders that are led by the Holy Spirit. That way, if the Holy Spirit says in your spirit that we need to leave some time right here for people to just meditate and, and, and for people to reflect on God, then it's okay. It's okay. You have the freedom to do that. Now, we understand we got other services coming in or whatnot, but there should be times whenever we're not just singing that we're just meditating and it's quiet and it should be okay. And we should be able to teach people the importance of quietness in the worship experience and create moments of time where they can re reflect and respond to what God is doing in their life. And the final one, number seven, is this. Stop assuming that everyone in your congregation knows how to worship. So whenever we say, I want you, I want everyone to kneel down, I want you to lift your hands, the majority of people in that church, they don't know what that means. They don't know why they're lifting their hands. They don't know why they're kneeling down. They don't know why they're dancing or they don't know any. They don't know what scriptures that give them the permission to dance or give them the permission to shout unto God with a voice of triumph. They don't understand what it means to take the posture of holding your hands out or lifting your hands up or kneeling down or bowing down or prostrating themselves before God. It is your chance, my friend, as a worship leader to teach the people about, not just about God, but how they can worship God and what it means and what it actually looks like to worship God. So take the opportunity to do that and don't miss it. So my friend, I know that everybody watching this video is not a worship leader and you may not be a pastor of a church, you may not be on staff at a church, but I didn't mention this before, but I'm going to start an entire series at some point going through uh, uh, issues going on in the church where I'm going to talk about how we can make the church better so that we can reach more people with Christ. So um, if you have any that you want to add to this list or if you have any tips on how worship can be, can be improved in your churches, leave it in the comment section below. Below. If you have a worship leader that you know, I would encourage you to share this video with them, share it with your senior pastor, and hopefully something that I said on this video will help improve the worship at your church. If you found this video helpful in any way, feel free to share it with a friend. Also, if you haven't done so already, I would love it if you would subscribe. Check out some of the other videos on this channel. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time on The Beach.